somebody gave the episode or maybe unanimously people hated a particular episode and we just got hate comments and all that stuff and i was like wow it doesn't get any worse than this that, and then that uh, that did happen actually we did do an episode where we got unanimous hate comments and the next week the show almost did end <laughs> You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield. Ew, seriously? So gross. And Big Anklevich. Ew, seriously? That is so gross. Howdy, y'all. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Howdy, y'all. That's what you're going with? What, what would you go with? If I don't know. The end of the world is going to have howdy, y'all. This... All right. Hello, goodbye. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 127. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anglovich. Welcome to another depressing as hell episode. Another. Well, I think we've done a few of them in the past, too. Spoilers. <laughs> yes. This is not for the chipper of heart, this story. But it, what, what is the story called? This story is called The Last Words of Daniel Shupak. Oh, gosh, not another Tupac story. How, how does this keep happening? Well, apparently he was uh, quite a figure in music history. He was. Hey, that ain't funny, man. Tupac was a national hero. I think that's what I was saying, but sorry. <laughs> you, of course, come from the other side of that argument, having been named after Biggie Smalls. That's right. So... How about telling me about today's author? The story is The Last Words of Daniel Shupak by Eric William Bergmeier. Eric William Bergmeier is a freelance writer and translator. Okay. His stories have appeared or are forthcoming in Basement Stories, Acapella Zoo, and Pseudopod. This story was originally published in Encounters magazine in the summer of 2010. Today's story was produced by Clay Duggar, Claymond Luxury Duggar. He curated it for us, too. It is a fine job. Maybe we should say something about Clay's podcast. We could, yes. Clay has a podcast called Righteous Dudes Dude Cast. Is it really Dude Cast? Yes, it is. I, I'm pretty there sure. There are two dudes in the title? He's the Righteous Dude, and he has a Dude Cast. But something. it's not Righteous Dude Cast. It's Righteous Dude's Dude Cast. Uh-huh, but I'm pretty sure. Huh. The Righteous Dude.podomatic.com. Uh so yeah, on with the story. The Last Words of Daniel Shupak by Eric William Bergmeier. Margaret said, It's only blood. And Daniel passed her a tissue. He frowned because he remembered what a bloody nose could mean. I suppose it doesn't matter now. Dessert is on the table. I'd, I'd love it if you came down. In a minute. He left her in the bathroom with a tissue twisted up into her left nostril, a bloody wick connected to a ticking time bomb. She slumped forward her palms against the counter. Oh, damn this headache. Bill was in the living room by the window, a slanted glass of whiskey between his fingers. He was running his thumb across his field of vision, tracing the horizon. When do you think it'll get here? Any minute now, Sandra said. Daniel walked up behind them and placed a hand on Sandra's shoulder. Dessert, anyone? Eat, drink, and be merry for tonight. It's just strawberries and vanilla ice cream. With all the stores being closed, we had to improvise. Hey, Sandy, remember that night we spent in La Concepcion? What was that, our third date? Our first. Really? It's amazing how it all blends together. He looked down into his glass, solemn. Sandra checked her watch. There was a commotion coming from the kitchen, but none of them thought to look. They knew it was only Alvin and his new girlfriend, Betty D., arguing about something trivial. 
Daniel thought back to the first time that he was formally introduced to Betty at one of Alvin's book signings. How she had tried to hug him and he pretended not to understand, worried that Margaret might recognize their past. He spent the rest of the night remembering what she would have felt like pressed up against him, or how her hair would have smelled. Is that for me? Margaret asked, coming down the stairs. Daniel handed her the bowl of ice cream, half melted now from the heat of his hand. She kissed him on the mouth, and he could taste the blood on her lips. So, when is this thing supposed to get here? Alvin said, stepping into the living room for the first time since the ruckus in the kitchen began. His shirt buttons were misaligned. Betty trailed behind him, a wisp of red hair trailing across her forehead. All hype and no delivery. Just like one of Alvin's books, Sandra said, and for the first time that evening, everyone laughed. It's been eleven and a half hours. It was supposed to take twelve to reach South Wyndham Falls. And that's further from the initial blast point than we are. Daniel thought back to that morning when he'd first heard about the accident. An explosion at a research facility in southern Pyongyang had sent out a low-velocity shockwave capable of disassembling all matter on the surface of the Earth. He was amazed at how quickly he'd come to terms with the idea of being obliterated. It was almost a relief. So, this is it, Betty said, smiling. Bill squirmed at the window, searching for the right phrase. Sandy, I want you to know that I've always... Oh, cut that shit out. His anger surprised him. You should have said all that before you got here. I think it's sweet. You think everything's sweet. <laughs> because you're a sucker for that sort of garbage. Betty buried her face in the waves of his leather jacket, and the hair fell away from her neck. Daniel followed the curve of it down into the fabric of her shirt. What are you thinking about, Daniel? What? I'm thinking about the time we went camping at Lake Russell. We'd spent that whole night in a hot tent because we were afraid that if we opened the zippers, mosquitoes would pour in like tap water. So the whole place it smelled like. Human sweat. But when we finally undid that main zipper to let in the sunlight, there was this deer just standing there, not five feet away. I consider it one of the most perfect moments of my life. Everyone else was quiet. Daniel pressed his eyelids shut. Ripples began to form in the middle of their glasses, little waves on an ocean of wine. The vibrations were getting closer. They could all feel it, a rumbling in the pit of their stomachs. It meant the impact was only minutes away. Do you think it will hurt? Like hell. It won't. We'll be obliterated, liquefied. Do you remember that time with the deer, Daniel? Of course I do. I love you. He did not answer. For the first time in his life, he did not answer. What he would have told her if he had had the nerve was that he was thinking about the night she had told him that she was sick, that all of those nosebleeds had been for a reason. He remembered it because it was the night he was planning on leaving her. His bags were already in the closet, packed. But then she had said to him, I'm, I'm sick, sick Daniel. Daniel. And he knew he could not go. Not if he wanted a clear conscience. Certainly not if he wanted to start his life anew. I think we have one more bottle of wine in the basement. Making his way quickly down the rickety wooden steps, Daniel became aware of how completely the voices from upstairs were swallowed up by the background vibrations. How easy it would be if he decided that he preferred it, to die down here, alone. It might be easier if you turn on the light. Daniel saw her familiar outline defined by the glow of the stairwell. She flicked the switch. He allowed his eyes a moment to adjust, and then said, I was trying to feel the vibrations through the floor. He crouched down and set his palms on the foundation. Betty's bare feet slapped against the stone. 
she squatted down beside Daniel and put her hand on top of his. Her hair brushed past the tip of his nose. It tickled him, and he could feel the hot tears collecting in the corners of his eyes. Your wife is beautiful. A beautiful person. Daniel raised an eyebrow. Beautiful, sure, but dull. The kind of person you realize you do not want to be around when you know you are about to die. Betty smiled. I've always thought of her as a character in some classic Victorian novel. Compassionate, steadfast, conflicted, a lady of virtue. Have you ever read A Mill on the Floss? It's one of Alvin's favorites. Why should I care what that asshole reads? Betty laughed, assuming it was a joke. You know, I, I would never have met him if not for you. What? Alvin. If you hadn't gushed so proudly about him back then, I might never have taken his class. I might never have fallen in love. He leaned back against an exposed stud and bit his lower lip. I suppose I should thank you. When they emerged from the basement, the last bottle of wine gripped between Daniel's quaking fingers, they found Sandra and Bill stuck together like a pair of candy apples, red, round, and top-heavy, not wanting to be caught off guard. Daniel noticed that the horizon was glowing, he imagined the atoms of the atmosphere being pulled apart and then put back together out of order, the way something like that might play with the light. Here. Bill handed him a filthy plastic cup. I think I'll skip the glass this time. He watched Betty as she walked over to Alvin and slipped her hands into his pockets. Alvin smiled. Where did you get You've to? had enough, I suspect. Margaret's eyes were on Daniel's wine. Daniel looked at her the crusted blood around the lip of her nostril. He lifted the bottle up to the light and decided that he could swallow the rest in a single, determined gulp. To hell with her notions of civility in the face of death. His first swig only polished off about half of what he had expected. It made him hate her even more. Margaret reached for his arms. Daniel, stop. He opened his throat proudly for the second time, letting the rest of the sour liquid cascade toward his stomach. Only this time it washed back and stung his sinuses. You're an idiot. The room shook a little more violently now than before, causing a vase to topple from the coffee table and smash across the floor. Little shards of glass decorated the space between everyone's feet. Daniel moved toward the closet to fetch the broom, a force of habit even as his house was falling apart around him. Margaret caught him by the wrist and forced him to look at her. Her eyes were wide, aglow with nervous energy. What was she thinking, he wondered. Was she aware of the stiffness in his features, the hard edge of his upper lip and the furrow in his brow, a look of cold indifference? Or was she oblivious to all of that, choosing instead to picture them as contented lovers on the cusp of an eternity together, entombed in a pure, sickly sweet sort of happiness? He felt Bill's fat back against his own. They had all come together now in the center of the room, and Daniel felt claustrophobic, surrounded by a throbbing, sweating, panicked mass. He wanted to push everyone away from him into the far corners of the house, to clear a little space in which to die. But more than that, more than distance and silence and love, he wanted to take his wife by the shoulders, set her face about an inch from his, and scream out, I would have left you if you hadn't gotten sick, or if I'd known that it was all going to come down to this, just dying in our living room within a year. Tell me you love me, Daniel. Yeah. What does that mean? He could smell Betty D. He watched her as she wrapped herself around Alvin, that swine, that supposed love of her life. He saw them kiss, hard, and his belly knotted. Daniel. The rumbling was like thunder now, only seconds away from impact. The windows rattled loudly. If he had left Margaret, they could have been together, he and Betty. 
he would not have to sit here in the last moments of his life watching her nuzzle another man, a hack writer who had not written a decent thing in over a decade, his friend, his best friend, a man he had come to hate. Daniel! He turned to her, their faces both twitching with emotion. How do you fit everything you have ever wanted to say to a person into a single second, he wondered. How do you concentrate all that you are into a drop? A sentence. A syllable. The windows gave in. Daniel cleared his throat as if to speak. But never said a word. And now, a word about today's story. I was driving with my wife through a fairly remote area of our home province when all of the stations on our car's radio suddenly went dead. Nothing but static all across the dial. It was an uneasy, disconnected sensation, and naturally, it got us talking about the apocalypse. Most people, when they're asked what they would do if they knew they were going to die, invent elaborate scenarios, experiences they've dreamed about for years but have never had the courage or time to do. I've always assumed that the opposite is true. That when pressed by the inevitability of death, people will bury themselves in domesticity and routine. The things they find the most familiar and most comfortable it's my guess that even when the world is crumbling around us, we will still clean our houses and cook our dinners and go to bed at a reasonable hour. We will still feel jealousy and anger and love. We will still do petty and hurtful things because that's who we are, no matter what the circumstance. This story is my attempt at capturing that feeling, the quiet, desperate longing for habit in our final moments, with a little regret thrown in for good measure. You know, Big, when the world is running down, you make the best of what's still around. Hanging on in quiet desperation is the English way. The time is gone. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> It just put me in that mood. You know how it is. You listen to a dismal story about the end of the world and how unhappy everyone is during the end of the world, and it just makes you think of Pink Floyd. Although, for you, it makes you think of the police, huh? Oh, okay. So, a cast list for that story. Did Clay prepare a cast list for us? He sure did. He is a righteous dude, you know? L. Scribe Harris was Betty. Gwendolyn Jensen Woodward was Margaret. Tanya Milojevic was Sandra. Spelled Tanja, right? Right. And Tobias Queen played the part of Alvin. Clay Duggar was the narrator. Rish Outfield was Daniel Shupak. Shakur, and Big Anklevich was Bill. So there's your cast. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks for participating in that story. And thanks, Clay, for producing this episode. Clay has done a few shows for us, and uh, he was going to do a production of Who Goes There, <laughs> the John W. Campbell story uh, that the thing from another world and the thing and the thing prequel remake we were all based on he uh, was going to do a great big audio drama what about that. the brother from another planet was that also based on that it, yes it was oh, okay good in that case i'm interested tell me more oh just uh, that clay has been doing a lot of podcasting sometimes uh, you'll hear him do a dribble cast story and uh anyway he's a nice guy he is he's a righteous dude that's true pod omatic I remember last week how you were talking about an infomercial guy getting you to buy things that you didn't need. How many Podomatics have you bought because of So many. Company? When I was first starting up the podcast, I was like, how do I do it? What do I do? And then I turned on the TV and it's like, are you wanting to start a podcast? Are you confused about which way to go? So I bought all sorts of Podomatics. Turns out I didn't need them after all. 
I was irritated, but I've got a closet full of them now. Sold some of them at the garage sale last year, but... If any of our listeners need a Potomatic, <laughs> you just answer this simple trivia question. Back in episode 73 of The Dune Steve, we had two faux celebrities adding their voices to our little banter. Who was the third? Okay, so what did you think of the story, Rish? Was it a happy-go-lucky kind of a story or what? It wasn't. In fact, I, I would have preferred you not ask me that question because I was like, <laughs> oh, I'll jump on this and I'll ask Big what he thought and then he can talk. Because if you had asked me what I thought, I would have been like, well, it, it really bummed me out. I, I'd rather not talk about it. I'd rather just hold myself and rock okay. gently. Well, let's um, just go ahead and end the show then. But See you later, folks. It's something you said earlier. It's not the first depressing story that we've done on the show. It's got to be the most depressing, though, right? No? It yeah. could be. When I hear this story, it makes me think back to... Hangman by Abby Merck Rustad. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yes, that one. When the thing yells Mizragta and <laughs> eats them alive. <laughs> uh... <laughs> I love that you still remember Miss Racta. Uh, no, uh, it reminds me a lot of that story we did way back in episode 10 that was called Into Silence Like a Shout by uh, Pete Tuzinski. That's the, there are no dwarf women story. Yeah, it's the story where like the great conquering king, like basically King Aragorn has f- saved the world and then the moon is just going to crash into the world and nothing can stop it. And he talks to all his wizards and they're like, no, nah, nothing can stop it. He tries everything. They're like, no, nothing can stop it. So finally they just make peace with the end of the world. And this one was a really similar thing, although a little bit more, much more dire because they didn't make peace with the end of the world. They just regretted everything, or at least our main character did. He regretted everything that he'd wasted his life away on. You know, he'd wanted to leave this woman. He found out that she was sick, and so he stuck with her until the end of her life, which happened to be the end of his life. He didn't know that at the time. He thought, oh, I can stick with her another year and then move on. And instead, nothing worked out, and he's so regretful. And plus the chick that he wanted to be with was with his best friend yeah well, but he didn't realize if he didn't know if he even wanted that guy as his friend uh, he didn't right. know whether he liked that guy anymore right he or- didn't like his friend anymore he was in love with that girl that was with his friend and he wound up getting them together and had he left his wife in the first place then he could have been able to get with her because then he would have been free and instead now she's with his best friend and he regrets everything I don't know. It just makes it so much more dismal and so much more sad. It makes you wonder. You know, he talks in his authors know how people, will, you know, they'll keep doing the things that they do and they'll have a party and all their friends will be over and they'll drink the last of their wine as the end of the world comes down upon them. Well, it's something that we talked about when we first read the story and then again today is what would you do if it was over? If the world was coming to an end, there's no escaping, there's no preventing it, there's no postponing it, it's just going to happen. And I I think the answer is, who knows? You don't know until you're faced with that. Some people would, as Eric suggested, would pretend, would go about their their lives as normal, try and keep normality. And then I think other people would do the complete opposite. It's like everything that I was always afraid to do before, I'm going to do now, or everything that there would always be consequences for doing I'm going to do now. Yeah, you'd probably have to lock your doors to uh, make it through the last 24 hours because there's probably like 15 rapists at your door just knocking on the door saying, come out. And at the same time, there'd probably be people who's like, I'm going to choose when I die. You know, I'm going to take all these pills or I'm going to take this bullet and the end of the world will come by my choice kind of thing or... You know, people that would just curl into a ball and, and, you know, pray and, you know, hope that there's more beyond and that this is just a temporary end. And I I don't know. Everybody has their own thing. I guess the natural inclination would be like, well, I would hold my family close and we'd all huddle together and say our goodbyes and sing Kumbaya and it's a small world and I'm sexy and I know it. And hopefully that would be a happy way to go out. 
but what if you didn't want that? What if your family was like, get on the couch, come on, we're all, you know, second verse of Kumbaya <laughs> and you wanted Same to be as alone. Verse, a little bit louder and a little bit worse. Would it be really a little bit worse? <laughs> But you wanted to be alone or you wanted to, I, I don't know, that was the, the wife, was it a wife, girlfriend, whatever it was, you know, telling him not to drink. Oh, you know, yeah. You've got to. You've My goodness. Be a good example. You've got to toe the line. You've got to put your best foot forward, even at the end, you know, it's like keep control or be dignified or whatever. But there would be people who would want to scream at the, the heavens and rail at it against it. But to, yeah, to have somebody tell you what you have to do at the end of your life would be really hard. It would. You know, you talk about getting together with your family and singing Kumbaya. Is that something you can do as the end of the world barrels down upon you? Oh, well, I, that just can seemed you, like... Can you happily sing Kumbaya? I mean, if you've got a family with children in it, for example, how, how are they going to deal with that? And you were now their parents, so you're going to have to like, it's, you can't say it's going to be okay. You can't say anything. There's no way to comfort these children who are like, ah. Well, do you kill them? <laughs> I no, no, I mean, I'm serious. Do. I think a lot of people would be like, well, it, it's, it's Hitler in the bunker kind of thing. You know, first he killed Blondie and then he killed, you know, himself and, 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 and his wife, but that dog was like Hitler's kid. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to put the dog out of its misery. Or, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, yeah, you, I don't know see, either. You could see people saying, you know, I'm going to give my kids pills and put them to tuck them in and say, we're just going to have a little nap. Yeah. Or maybe you just don't. I mean, I don't know if you can keep them from knowing what's going on, but maybe you just don't tell them what's going on. And you put on Aladdin and you watch it. Until the end comes or something like that. I don't oh, know. Oh, you know that? That doesn't seem too bad. You put on your favorite movie or whatever. Um, but what if you were at you work? Put on your, you, you wind up putting on like Wonder Pets or something so the kids will want to watch. It's the problem. And see there, that's exactly the thing. You're thinking about them rather than yourself. It's the same as, as just killing yourself early. You might as well. <laughs> that's funny but yeah and who gets to decide what's on the tv you know the youngest gets to decide but you're at work when you find out that this thing's going to happen would you even be able to make it home yeah i don't know because the traffic would just be i don't i i think it would just be stopped right and and even if it wasn't what's to stop somebody from saying you know i'm going to drive my car off of a bridge or something and that that stops traffic too or right. i'm going to take my rifle with me and we're just going to pick off other drivers or all the people who are just driving in the traffic trying to get home and then this traffic stops and they're just like oh screw it and they get out of their car and they just leave it right there and start walking or something that's sure not going to help traffic so if you couldn't make it home what would you do i don't know be so fun to just hang out with everybody at work, huh? I'm not, I, I imagine you'd just go into your <laughs> office and close the door and call your your family and say your goodbyes that way. But if but who knows? Get, if you could get phone service. Oh, there you go. I don't know what happened to the satellites or to the... I, I, is it possible for all of the lines to be jammed like it used to be back in the days when... I think uh, that it is. I don't know. Yeah, that's why I was saying that if you could get phone service because everybody would be calling somebody, you know. It's like my wife is from Canada, so you know she would have to be like calling her parents and her sister and her brothers and so forth. How long would that last? How long would you be able to uh, get through? If everybody was going to die, not just you... And your family, would there be a point in trying to contact everybody and say their goodbyes because they're doing the same thing and everybody, you know what I mean? It just, I, we've never had a global disaster like that. I mean, obviously, maybe the dinosaurs did, but when it's that widespread, do you need people manning the cell phone towers and all that stuff to get the lines going? I mean, would, would the power not go out? With some, well, I don't know that the power would go out or stay on because I think a lot of that stuff is fairly self-sufficient. I mean, they don't have like 15 people down there, you know, turning cranks and making sure it keeps going. It's machines that just go and for 24 hours, they're just going to keep going. If you have a zombie apocalypse and like people don't man the power plants for months and years, then yeah, they're going to break down and everything's going to stop working. But uh, I would think in 24 hours, it wouldn't be that great unless 
you know, it was an actual disaster where things are blowing up. Starting in Pyongyang, you know, they don't have any power anymore. But until the grid starts breaking apart, I think you probably are, are fine as far as that goes. Um, it wouldn't matter if you needed somebody because nobody's going to stay and do that. Except for the bachelor, you know, orphan guy who's never uh, had anyone that he loves and he loves his job more than anything else. And so that's what he wants to do for his last 24 hours or whatever. Going back to Into Silence Like a Shout that we mentioned before, they talked about that where, you know, the end of the world was coming, the moon was coming down, it was going to destroy the world, and this king, all of his army was steadily slipping away. They weren't sticking around to protect the borders and stuff like that. There was nothing he could do, you know, he couldn't fault him, he couldn't be upset. Because what would he do? What would anyone do? Of course they're going to slip away and go see their family. They're not going to stick around and make sure that the news gets on or radio traffic report still gets through or make sure that the power keeps going. That You know, those things aren't as important as they used to be. Because you're in a unique job, you don't think that there would be pressure that's like, hey, we are responsible for letting people know what to do and what the end is coming or whatever. Nobody's going home. You're all working. <laughs> Am I wrong in, there, in there thinking that? There probably would be pressure, yeah. I know that there is stuff like that where, you know, if there's a disaster, would you volunteer to be here and make sure that the TV stays on and the news keeps getting out for the people that are out there? You know, they want people to volunteer for that so that when there's the earthquake, the news still gets on and stuff like that. A worldwide disaster, I, I, yeah, I, I think it would be different. You know that it's coming. It's just a steady shockwave that's coming to destroy everything nothing could hold people there no matter what not even a loaded gun could hold somebody there anymore because so what you know you got 24 hours anyways so who cares just keep walking if they shoot you well then you have less hours after all but not by much his story it really gets your mind going as to what could happen it's one of the really cool things about speculative fiction is that you can come up with these kind of what ifs and put them out there and just see what if this was happening, what would you do? And in his story, he shows what these people did. You know, they had themselves a little soiree and had strawberries and ice cream and wine. What would you do, though? You know that everybody who's hearing that story is thinking the same thing. And that's what you thought when you read the story. You thought, well... So it'd be really interesting just to talk about what you would do if that was the case. Do you remember Deep Impact? Uh -huh. It was the good asteroid film from 98. The good and less profitable asteroid film? There's that moment where uh, Tia Leone's character, she goes to the beach uh -huh. and her father is there. The father would always stand on the beach and watch the waves and they just stand there and wait for it to happen and wait for it and then the tidal wave comes and, and it yeah and it remember it sucks the water in <laughs> before the big wave comes and it's that and that the the sucking of the water was really upsetting to me you know, just the <laughs> because we've never seen that happen you know i mean it's just like oh geez <laughs> i don't know I, I, i've heard about that of why the water would do that and stuff but just that that was really scary you know, they were standing there and it was kind of a not a romantic moment, but a romanticized moment of, you know, this is nice because I really like the ocean. I find peace in staring at the ocean. And, the, and But then you see the ocean retreat. And, the, and I, as I, if I recall, there was a noise when it did that. And anyway, I, I, again, how would I get to the ocean? There's, there's no way. And the ocean like would that. come to you. Uh, is, is this why <laughs> you chose to accept this story? Yeah, the conversation afterward i mean because it can't be that you got a kick out of the story well the story's a good story it was well written and and yeah it brings up a lot of really interesting topics so i thought it was worth having on aside from the fact that it's it's uh, a well done story but yeah i mean it is depressing hopefully nobody's taking their life right now although they probably kind of we, we we lose about one listener a show just from people who take their lives as they're listening to our conversation. They're just like, oh, these guys, I wish they'd shut up. Okay, it's not worth it anymore. <laughs> see, I'd never see the stats, so I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> but uh, but it makes sense. 
there were people that used to comment a lot and now they don't. <laughs> yeah, the, just the idea that you have to maintain your dignity and your composure when everything is coming down. Like, that, you know, that you have to pretend with your kids that it's going to be all right. That's kind of horrible. I, at the end of Dark Knight, remember, he Two-Face tells Commissioner Gordon to tell his son that it's going to be all right when he knows that it's not. That's got to be really hard. I, I, and I don't know. I don't have kids, so I don't... I don't see the nobility in that because it's futile. You know, it's just like we're mm -hmm. going to pretend that everything is all right and we're going to watch the friggin' Wonder Pets for the next half hour because we're not going to make it to the end credits. I don't think I could do that. Well, yeah, the Wonder Pets is really bad. Maybe if it was like a Phineas and Ferb episode, I could, ha I could do it. But there were no kids in this story, so there, there, there wasn't the specter of the apocalyptic equivalent of staying together for the children. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I suppose there's a lot of stuff like that. There, there might be a lot of families that would take their kids to the park and push them on the swings and stuff. I, I don't know. I have no idea. Cause I can't put my mind in a parent who's about to die and knows the kids are about to die. And it just, I guess, I, I, just the same as I don't know exactly what I would do. Right. You can guess. But yeah, just the, the idea of pushing your kids on the swings while the shockwave is approaching, that's kind of ghastly too. <laughs> yeah. There's no way for it not to be ghastly in a situation like that, really. The worst thing would be if you had just started a really good novel. <laughs> and you're like, oh, crap, there's no way I'm going to make it to the end. What do I do? Just read the last page, man. Like Harry does every book that he reads. <laughs> that, my friend, is the dark side. There you go. All right. I think we've uh, said our piece. Well, no, I'm curious what other people think, too, uh, what the story made them think. And, and, and I mean, I, I'm not asking people, what would you do if the shockwave was coming? And all that, Because that's it's a stupid question, isn't it? Or, or is it not stupid at all? Is it? I don't think it's stupid, but I think it's interesting that we could talk. If only we had a place where they could go and tell us what they would do. Maybe they could just mail us letters. Hmm. You're waiting for me to tell people that they can comment about it in the forums? Or are you waiting for me to ask them for, to donate to the show? Comment about it in the forums. Oh, comment in the forums. Well, yes, do that if you'd like. I don't care. I'm not going to check to see what you say. So <laughs> there you go. He wants to know what you would do, but will not check to see what you say. So that's a futile thing as well. It's all futile. It's, it is kind of ghastly as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've got 45 minutes of the next Dune Steve episode to listen to, but we've only got 15 minutes before the shockwave hits. <laughs> what do we do? All right. Thanks for uh, listening, folks. And have a more upbeat day. Have a happy end of the world. That's all right. I'm Big Anklevich. I'm Rich Outfield. Talk to you later. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Wow, today's show sucks more than a Shakespeare monologue delivered by Vin Diesel. Take two. Okay, so what number is this? 127. 127? Are you sure it's not 167? <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Very, very sure. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Why do you laugh? What do you think we are, the travel cast or something? And we are recording. Hello, Clay. You are tearing me apart, Clay Doug. Wow, that was good. You are tearing me apart, Clay Doug. Sing it! Uh-huh. <laughs>
this. Blah, blah, blah. Hmm. Did he give any direction on how he wanted it done? He said he wanted it done masterfully. That's oh, all. That is all. Go. I suppose it doesn't matter now. <laughs> when do you think it'll get here? Any minute now. Daniel walked up behind them and placed a sentence. Uh, you are super depressed because your life didn't, you didn't do the things that you wanted to in your life. Wow, this is going to require some oh, real acting. <laughs> Betty trailed, Betty trailed behind, <laughs> capable of disassembling all matter on the surf, surf of the earth, surfing the earth. Dun, 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 uh, skeet surfing. Dun, 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 dun. And then there's the girl you wish you were with. Just to make sure she isn't freaking out. Long sentence here. An explosion in a research facility in Southern Pyongyang. An ex... <laughs> no, I can't think. God, thanks, Ventura. Should I do it a different way? Loser. <laughs> oh. Damn you, Pyongyang. So when's this thing supposed to get here, huh? All hype and no delivery. Oh, wait, Petty says that. <laughs> Uh, I just thought of something Rish would say that was entirely offensive, and I'm not going to say it, but that's all right. We'll let Rish do that on the show. Uh. <laughs> Nobody sent me any bloopers. I have to create my own. Uh. <laughs> this is not helping. I want to get this done. I'm tired of having projects hanging over my head. And on to the next line. And ex can't breathe. An explosion at the research facility in southern Pyong and southern 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 Pyongyang had sent out a low velocity shock. That Pyongyang just south of Atlanta. Gosh, that would suck, man. An explosion at a research facility in southern Pyong Pyong Pyong. How do you say that Pyong? Yang Yang. <laughs> uh, R-O-8-O-T, you can just edit that out, right? What? Announcer man, how do you say Pyongyang? I'll do it even nastier this time. Oh my gosh. An explosion at a research <laughs> Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Why couldn't the research facility been in freaking Chicago? I can say Chicago. Ugh. <laughs> uh, I guess Clay gets to decide who says what, but... Not quite. It says everyone else was quite. Everyone else was quite quiet. Feels like a girl question. Just don't let Abby Hilton hear me say that. Ripples began to form in the middle of their glass. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Can't do things like that. Ah. Do you think it will hurt? It might be easier if you turn on the light. Dead babies, dead babies, dead babies, dead babies. Okay, because I'm just the one that's nasty. Yeah, you're the... <laughs> that didn't work. Now I'm laughing more. Shit. Ah. Why did I decide to narrate this? Why didn't I just let somebody else do it? But that is the yeah, that's the author. One plowing my the girl <laughs> out. He allowed his eyes a moment to um. He allowed his eyes a moment to adjust. To adjust, and then said, "Tell me you love me, Daniel." He allowed his mo allowed his moments and I to adjust. Um, God, those, I hate it when the moments aren't adjusted. He allowed his eyes a moment to adjust and then said, 
I was trying to feel the vibrations through the floor. <laughs> she squatted. She squatted. Your loving family awakened yeah. once again. He crouched and she squatted. Oh, never mind, I'm not going to go there. Betty's, Betty, Betty, Betty. My Betty didn't do it. And he could feel the hot tears collecting and collecting, clicking, hot tears clicking. Da, 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 da. Daniel leaned back against an exposed stud and bit his uh, <laughs> exposed uh, she, He leaned back against the exposed stud. Uh, that's why he wants to leave his wife, because he's playing for the other team. <laughs> I've read this how many times, and that never hit me until just now. Authors, read your stories out loud to yourself before you finalize them. Because you don't want your main character leaning back against a stud who is exposed. He leaned, oh, I got him. He leaned back against an exposed stud and bit his lower lip. God, that doesn't make it any better. <clears throat> When they emerged from the basement, all hot and sweaty and smoking a cigarette, he and the stud, Betty's still down there. No, sorry. We won't go there. When they... <laughs> Should I be even nastier or is that fine? He felt... Daniel felt claustrophobic. 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 They forgot the R in there. It's supposed to have a phrobic in there. Think they'll make it? It'd take a miracle. Hmm. Rock on. Okay. So, what number is this? One two seven. One twenty seven. Are you sure it's not one sixty seven? Yes. Oh. Okay. Very very sure. Sorry. I don't know. <laughs> Why do you laugh? <laughs> what do you think we are, the travel cast or something? Did you see Jason Sanford's tweet? I didn't. He put out a tweet, you know. The oh, the one tour. about Hugo's? Yeah, where he said he was going to nominate us for the Hugo, and I thought, wow. For best fanzine is what I think what he said, it's right? fan or cast, fan I think. Cast. It's a new category that they've never had before. This year is the first year where they're doing a Hugo for the best, like, Science fiction podcast. Oh, that's so cool! Wouldn't wouldn't that be cool? And I assume yeah. they invented that category so that Starship Sofa can not steal nominations from actual magazines. Gosh, there can't man. be. I mean, I don't know. Well, Escape Pod probably is going to get a nomination. I was going right? to say, I don't know who's going to nominate what, but I wonder if just one vote from Jason Sanford is enough to get us on the ballot. How many votes are there? Because there's lots of those categories. Uh, I, we know Resnick votes. There you go. <laughs> and he, you know, he, this year he's like the guest of honor at the uh, Worldcon. That would be I really don't, neat. I don't but I can't us get to my ever get hopes one, up. But now. it would be cool to be on the ballot. That would be neat. We could say we were Hugo nominated. Yeah, it would. That would be again an honor to be nominated. <laughs> yeah, that's what I wrote because. Uh, Jason Sanford, when he said it, he says, my nominations for this award are Dune Steve and Starship Sofa. And I wrote him back and said, wow, thanks. As they say, Jason, it's an honor to be nominated. <laughs> That's cool. I sent him an email today about the, you know, if people like it, I'll write more and mm -hmm. just let him know that one person has commented that he like that he wants more. And, and you can add the two of our votes to that. Okay, so 167, 127. <laughs> 167. I don't know why. Well, what do you think we are? Escape pod? I am never going to make it to 167. It'll be. Oh, we won't, but. Beyond next year before we ever get to 167. You, it would be at least 2014, I'm willing to say. On our docket, it only goes as far as 139. <laughs> it's got a Tanya pronouncement. Yeah, but I can't say it. Milojevic. Jeez Louise. There might be children listening. His stories have appeared or are forthcoming in Basement Stories. Tell me what you know about Basement Stories. Basement Stories 
is something I don't know anything about. Oh. Sorry, I tried. But, okay, but if you had to guess, what would basement stories be? It would be all stories about people who were locked in the basement by their evil parents and had to escape and murder them. Well, that sounds kind of like a cool <laughs> idea for a, an anthology. An entire magazine every month. New stories on that every time. And, and what goes on at the dude cast? Uh, I believe it's like a Christian podcast where he talks about how you can still be cool even though you're a Christian. So with lies is what you're saying. <laughs> He shows you that you don't have to be a pent-up douche, I guess. It's not necessarily the deal. You don't have to be a pent-up douche, but it helps. <laughs> there is nothing we won't try. Never heard the word impossible this time. There's no stopping us. Cut it out.